Hey everyone, I'm Paige Smith with Below the Radar, a knowledge democracy podcast. Below the Radar is created by my office, SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement, and is recorded on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. On this special episode of Below the Radar, our host Am Johal speaks with SFU professor and Lacan Salon's president, Clint Burnham. This interview was filmed in person and at a safe distance on SFU's Vancouver campus. Am and Clint speak about Lacan's enduring impact on clinical psychoanalysis and Lacanian theory in our current cultural and political moment. I hope you enjoy this episode. Hi there, welcome to Below the Radar. Really delighted that you could uh, join us. We're usually uh, recording in audio on our uh, podcast uh, and also over Zoom since the pandemic landed down. Uh, for the first time, we're recording live in studio at the World uh, Art Center. We're here with our guest, uh, Dr. Clint uh, Burnham from SFU's English department. Welcome, Clint. So a number of things I want to uh, talk to you about. Uh, you've been involved with the Lacan Salon for uh, a long time, since like 2005, 2006. And for our listeners who don't uh, know about it, could you introduce it a, a little bit and, and yourself as well? Sure. Yeah. Happy to do so. Um, yeah. So Lacan Salon started in uh, the fall of 07, 2007. And uh Hilda Fernandez, who's a clinician here in Vancouver, and she's actually doing her PhD in geography at, uh, at SFU now. She sent around this email saying, let's read Lacan together. And um, so she was there from the very beginning. Uh, Paul Kingsbury, who teaches in geography at SFU, was there. Uh, I was there. A few others, uh, Jesse Proudfoot. And um, basically, it's been a reading group that meets every two weeks on a Tuesday evening. And we've been working our way through the massive oeuvre that is uh, uh, the psychoanalysis of Jacques Lacan. He's a French psychoanalyst, uh, active from the 50s until 1980. Um, and uh, essentially, one of his, his key kind of bodies of work are these, uh, these seminars that he gave on a weekly basis from 52 or 53 until 1980. Um, and uh, we read uh, a chapter or two at a time, very uh, slowly, very closely, different people facilitate. Uh, it's really been a great uh, sort of collective uh, experience. There's been hundreds of people who've, been, who've come to the salon over the years. And then since March of uh, 2020, uh, when the pandemic hit, we kind of, okay, we realized we can't really crowd a bunch of people into a room together. That's not really working anymore. Um, and we decided to try doing it online uh, using Zoom, as everyone is. Um, and it's, uh, so it's really created kind of like this online or virtual or world uh, community of people uh, reading uh, Lacan. And his, his ideas and his thoughts, which we can get into as well, have been read around the world. He's translated into dozens of languages. He's read in Japan. He's read certainly in Latin America as a huge sort of psychoanalytic community uh, across Europe, uh, in Africa, and uh, across Canada as well. Mm -hmm. Now, the Lacan Salon's also done what they call the Le Conference, which is, you know, a conference is done on different themes every uh, couple of years. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about some of the, the past conferences. Uh, and remember, there was one recently on, on love just a few years ago. It's La Conference. Um, but so we when we began this uh, conference series, I think it was uh, 2011 was the first one. Um, we've had it around town. And uh, yeah, they sometimes they're on a certain kind of a text or an anniversary. Uh, I think it was in 2016 when the conference was on love. Um, and the most recent one in 2018 on, uh, was on the environment, the Lacan and the environment. And uh, that's uh, being turned into a book, being published by uh, Paul Grave uh, next year, uh, that Paul Kingsbury and I are, are co-editing. And so again, we've, We've, uh, you know, we sort of, we do them on a very kind of small scale, like I think usually our budget for these conferences have been two or three thousand dollars. And, you know, we try to fly like one person in, maybe have a local person as a keynote as well. And uh, Andrew Formantel was here a few years ago. Andrew Formantel, yeah. the, uh, the late, uh, an amazing sort of French uh, critic, a deconstructive critic, a psychoanalytic critic and, and clinician. She was quite, uh, quite amazing. And it's uh, these, and we've we've really tried to keep these open to the public with no uh, sort of conference fees. So on the one hand, it's very obtruse, 
complicated sort of uh, dense theory and so on. But at the same time, we've we've had these reading groups and we've had these conferences where you know anyone can walk in the door and take and take uh, take part. So we really think there's a there can be a way to, and I think it's what's interesting about what we're doing here in Vancouver. There can be a way to. Um, talk about ideas uh, with different audiences. It doesn't depend on having a PhD. It doesn't depend on having a lot of money. Uh, it just depends on a willingness to, to sit down and read texts and think about them and talk about them in a thoughtful way. And as you were saying uh, about Lacan in, in Latin America, in Europe, um, uh, he's read and within psychoanalysis itself is quite uh, mainstream uh, in terms of um, uh, people taking up his ideas and utilizing them in, in clinical practice. In a North American context, it's um, at least within psychoanalysis itself or in the, the more professionalized forms of it, it's maybe more marginalized here, but in um, at universities, in theory, in other places, in art, uh, Lacan is somebody who gets referenced uh, quite a bit. How do you account for the way um, uh, his ideas and his work um, have been kind of filtered in, a, in the, at least the U.S. Canadian context in comparison to how his work circulates in, in other places. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's something we think about a lot. So on the one hand, he has this kind of global clinical practice, um, and, uh, but that it's global in, in the sense that it's, it's, uh, it's Europe and, and not North America. I mean, it's in South America, it's in Asia. It's in India, it's in Africa, but uh, it's not in Canada and the U.S. where the therapeutic practice tends to be much more, let's solve a problem, whereas talk therapy and, and Freudian therapy and, and Lacanian theory, therapy isn't necessarily about just making you feel better in the short term, but spending time to, to try and understand what the more structural or deeper kind of uh, causes are. And I think for Lacanian theory in particular, what does make it differ both from a lot of forms of uh, therapeutic culture, uh, but even from classical Freudian uh, therapy, is that he's not saying this is just an individual problem. He's saying this is social. I mean, his he has his famous sort of sound bites like the unconscious is the discourse of the other, or this idea of extimacy. Instead of intimacy, instead of something being interior to you, it's exterior to you. So your unconscious is social. It has to do with the world that's around you. Um, and, that's, and that's, I think, why uh, his ideas as well have been uh, sort of taken up in, in film and in uh, fine art and in political theory and in philosophy, because it's not simply a matter of, uh, of uh, this kind of interiorized, individualistic sort of approach to, uh, to what uh, psychic sort of turmoil is, but to sort of locate it in a more kind of social uh, context. And I'll give you kind of an example of this. So uh, a sort of a key uh, Lacanian idea is, is the sort of notion of the split subject. And so it's like the idea of the unconscious. We have these desires, libidinal desires or anxieties that are within us that we, uh, we don't know what to do with in, in certain kinds of ways. Um, and so for Lacan, he says this is because we're also subjects to language and language is something outside of us, something that we don't, you don't own your language, you have to use the language that's there. Um, so you think of the what we now uh, talk about in, in everyday language and, and in a political way of microaggressions. So microaggressions are uh, these things that appear to be on the one hand as a minor or as a maybe even a positive kind of statement that somebody makes that when read in a different kind of way, when you look at it a bit differently, turn out to be some kind of a, a form of sexism or racism. So if I say to you, uh, oh, I love your skin. You have such beautiful hair, right? Like from a white person to a person of color, there's on the one hand at the surface, I love your skin. You have a beautiful skin color. I love your hair. You know, can I touch your hair, right? This is, uh, I love your beard. This is a, this appears to be, you know, a uh, um, sort of a positive sort of statement, but um, you know, any four-year-old child would tell right away that there's something else going on there. And when Lacan theorized this, he says, well, unconsciously, there's a kind of malevolence or an aggressivity that's at work there at the same time. So that's an example on the one hand of that Lacan's theorizing of, what, of who we are as subjects and so on is, uh, is social, that it's not just saying it's an individual, you know, the racism isn't just an, an individual problem, but it's social, but also that it has to do with this, uh, that, it can, that it can find an example in these kind of everyday political uh, sort of inter, uh, exchanges. Now, how were you first um, introduced to uh, Lacan and how do you use his work 
uh, now in terms of, of writing that you're that you're doing? Well, um, uh, how I was introduced to this, I mean, this goes back to when I was uh, an undergraduate in the 1980s <laughs> in Victoria. And, uh, you know, theory was just, uh, cultural theory was this brand new thing in the Canadian Academy at that time. And my professor at the time, Evelyn Cobley, she was the first person to hire there. This is 85 or 86 to teach uh, theory. I came from a background where I was the first person in my family to go to university. You know, I didn't grow up reading uh, Shakespeare or Jane Austen or Charles Dickens and so on. I grew up reading like the Hardy Boys and the, you know, Reader's <laughs> Digest or something, right? Like I didn't have any what's called cultural capital. But when this thing called theory arrived, well, nobody knew what it was. So this was something where if I figured out how this worked, that would give me an edge. I mean, I think it was unconsciously what was sort of happening there. I'm, I'm going to start uh, getting good at this, understanding this and learning this. And even though I didn't, I don't have all of the, uh, the English canon uh, already in my background, this is something that I can sort of, sort of pick up on. And Lacan was one of the figures uh, that, that people were reading. Um, I had this one professor, another professor, uh, Stephen Scobie, who was teaching about poetry, but also about film. And so we were reading him in terms of film theory. Um, and uh, so this was a, a new thing at that time. And then when I was uh, working on my PhD in the uh, early 1990s, the, the big Lacanian theorist was Slavoj Žižek, the Slovenian philosopher. Uh, he was very new then. His first book, Sublime Object of Ideology, came out in 1989 in English. Um, and he uh, sort of made Lacan more exciting because on the one hand, he was talking about pop culture. Uh, he was giving finding all these examples from Hitchcock films or uh, Jurassic Park or, or, or what have you. Uh, but also that he was... He was talking about Lacan in a political way. So he came from Slovenia, he came from the Balkans in the 1990s, the Balkan Wars are going on, of course. And he was, what was really interesting about what was one of the ways in which, uh, in which uh, Zizek talked about uh, um, this kind of rise of racism uh, and, and violence in, uh, in the Balkans in the 1990s was what he called uh, the theft of enjoyment. So uh, if I see, uh, if I see somebody uh, uh, playing basketball or tennis, somehow I think that their enjoyment steals my enjoyment. It's a threat to my enjoyment. Like it's a zero sum game. And it can, you know, that takes place in, in more innocuous forms too. I mean, you know, a teenager sleeping in on the weekend, we get, a, we get annoyed with this. But in a more malevolent way, of course, this is, uh, Zizek argued, and, you know, coming out of, uh, coming out of the former Yugoslavia, that, uh, Racism itself was the uh, was this was based on this idea that the racial other that their enjoyment is a threat to my enjoyment, and so he theorized racism as being uh, not only an economic thing or not only rooted in some kind of a biological fantasy of what race itself is, but that it had to do with with ideas of enjoyment. So he brought this different kind of vocabulary into political thought itself. And how do you use the the work now in terms of what you're reading? I know that you were. Uh, working on uh, some things related to Zizek and photography and other ways, but it's, it's continued on with uh, the writing that you're doing now. Yeah, a lot of it um, has to do with thinking about digital culture and the internet and so on. I had a book that came out uh, in 2018 called Does the Internet Have an Unconscious uh, on Zizek and digital culture. I'm working on a new um, uh, project called Lacan's laptop and so just think and so what I what I like to do is to look at these things in a very ordinary kind of way so if you just think of uh, of say the phrase lol that somebody types in an email or sends as a text and so on um, lol laugh out loud what is what does lol mean why do we say that why do we write lol is it are we laughing when we do it uh, so there's two, there's two kinds of ways of thinking about this. One is that what, what Zizek talks about in terms of enjoyment or what in French Lacan would call jouissance. And that doesn't mean just enjoyment in the sense of having a good time, but almost like a kind of almost unbearable sort of enjoyment. And jouissance in French also refers to like a sexual orgasm. So this kind of intense kind of enjoyment is LOL about that. Is it about this? Is it that you want to signal you're really having a good time? Like laugh out loud, but it's like, what kind of weird excessive thing there? Laugh out loud is kind of like I would have voted three times for Obama because what else, what other kind of laughter is there? I mean, is there silent laughter? You know, it's like, it's like you're really trying to overcompensate and let pers that person know you really were laughing hard. But the other way to think about LOL, 
what do we call them, emoticons and so on, is that it's almost as though by typing LOL, you don't have to laugh. And Zizek has this whole kind of theory of uh, what he calls interpassivity. Uh, an example he gives of that is the laugh track on a TV show. So you get home from work and you're tired, it's the end of a long day, and you put on Seinfeld, and uh, you know, they make some Kramer does some kind of a stupid routine, and you hear the, the audience laughter, you hear the canned laughter. They laugh, Zizek says, so you don't have to. That their laughter does the enjoying for you in a certain kind of way. And he says uh, uh, Zizek's idea of interpassivity is a kind of a counterbalance to the whole uh, excitement in the 1990s when digital culture was uh, first new and everything was supposed to be interactive. Like now you can, it's kind of like the choose your own adventure approach to, uh, to digital text and that. It wasn't passive like reading a book or watching a film or watching TV were seen as being passive. But with the internet, now it was, now it was and the computer, now it was uh, interactive. And he says, no, it's more like interpassive. Um, so in the same way that a television show soundtrack laughs so you don't have to laugh, the uh, typing out LOL, again, it's, it's interesting that it's laughter that's involved in both of these examples. You type LOL so you don't have to bother laughing. I mean, and how often, if you type LOL, do you actually laugh? And in, you know, linguists, uh, as you can imagine, have, have, have done theorizing about what LOL is. I mean, uh, some people talk about, about it as uh, what's called, I think it's John McWhorter, the, uh, uh, the African-American linguist working at NYU, I believe, or Columbia, who talks about it as being like a grammatical particle. So you're thinking in mean, Canadian vernacular when somebody says A, like they, and then we, know, we all have these friends who like they say it twice in every sentence or they say like and like and like or you know, you know, or yo, all those different, all those different sort of uh, scenes or words are, they don't really carry a semantic meaning, but rather they just punctuate the sentence itself, especially in spoken language. And LOL has that kind of function too. We all have those friends who when they send a text, they almost always seem to have LOL at the end of the little, of the little text itself. It's almost like a sign off thing or what linguists would say a signal for turn taking that somebody else can now uh, sort of uh, uh, engage in a conversation. So that's one thing I've been thinking about in terms of uh, in terms of the digital and thinking about the digital in terms of the uh, in terms of uh, psychoanalysis and the unconscious. And another way is a and I had an uh, article published a couple of years ago on uh, the conversation uh, the website and this was when the Canadian politician Tony Clement got in trouble for his, uh, his sexting, that he was uh, going on to uh, social media. And it, it didn't seem like, I, as I remember, and I could be, I, and I could be wrong, although he, I think he had to, I don't know if he was actually still in office at this point, or if he resigned because of it, or became this sort of uh, public uh, pylon. I don't think it was that he was actually sending uh, lewd pictures uh, and so on, but that he was, as uh, one uh, woman put it, aggressively liking people on Instagram. So he would go onto their Instagram feed and just like five or 10 or 20 of them at a time, and sometimes late at night and so on. But he was also sending messages, and messages of a sort of licentious or flirtatious sort of nature. Um, and, uh, and this kind of sexting, the most famous example probably uh, you know, is the American politician, Anthony Weiner, who was the unfortunate name, but who was sending uh, dick pics or crotch pics and so on to, uh, to young women from his phone as well. Sometimes even when he's in bed at night with his wife and that. So it's on the one hand, we have to think about why is it that we are doing this and uh, by we, I mean, I mean, almost all of us have no doubt sent vaguely inappropriate sort of texts and so on. That's, it's just been, it seems to be the nature of, you know, the device. I mean, you think of your phone, it's in, it's in your pants pocket uh, next to your genitalia, or it's in your purse next to your, your money, or perhaps your birth control uh, uh, pills. Uh, or even think of the, like I said, the one idea I have, or one, a title I have for a new project is Lacan's laptop. This idea of this device that we call a laptop. It's over our lap. It's like, it's somehow connected to that, to that part of our body. So in some ways this, uh, and this, the title of my, um, of my uh, article was all texting is sexting, because in some ways our engagement with these devices is already predetermined in a kind of way to have this licentious or libidinal sort of aspect to it. But psychoanalysis would also tell us that 
any speech, any interaction is always at the, is always about wanting to be loved. Um, that we want, we we always are are desiring this or seeking this. And this in no way, I, I mean, in, in no way to sort of like uh, try to minimize, uh, you know, actual aggressive acts and so on, or or you know, totally inappropriate kind of uh, kind of messages and so on. But even the most innocuous have that kind of an undertone to us. And we can see this, and, it's, and one of the advantages of, of psychoanalysis is kind of like, you know, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, a member of the British family like 50 years ago said, well, we're all Marxists now. I think in some way we're also all Freudians now. And I'll give you an example, there's the, um, uh, the food delivery service skipped the dishes. Uh, of course, they have since the pandemic began. They've been making money hand over fist, uh, more than restaurants, perhaps. But Skip the Dishes had these two billboards um, a couple of years ago, so pre, uh, pre-COVID. And one of them said, uh, for when the hot pick you sent to Dan went to dad. Okay. And another one said, when your text about Barb went to Barb. So the first one, but when your hot pick you sent to Dan went to dad. So it's, it's playing with a couple of different things there. One is the mortifying idea of sending this sort of semi-nude picture of yourself uh, that you meant to send to your boyfriend or your husband. Instead, it went to your father. So obviously that's playing with the whole kind of uh, incest taboo that we don't want to ha- our father to think about us in a sexual kind of way and so on. But then you have to think about, you know, the, the ad itself, it's Dan and dad. Dan and dad are very close to each other. I mean, maybe is it the idea that, you know, you would type in D-A-D instead of D-A-N, although, you know, on, on your list of contacts and so on, but maybe you are attracted to Dan because Dan reminds you of your dad. So there's that sort of uh, play going on. And then the, uh, when the text about Barb goes to Barb, so it's the idea that we're, you know, doing this kind of catty gossip online or on, on texting and so on as we are want to do, and you accidentally send it to the person that it's about. And in both those cases, you have to wonder how much of an accident is it that's happening there. But there's also two more kind of levels of the the text about Barb going to Barb. One is, of course, is the word calling it, uh, having choosing the name Barb, the, the, uh, is suggests a, a kind of a barbed wit already. Like there's a kind of a, a nastiness going on there. And, and this is only a personal thing, but my mother is named Barb. So it sort of fits in even perfectly to my kind of uh, theory of how these things work. And then finally, um, the both of these ads are for skip the dishes. So what they are is saying, oh, you have these digital malapropisms, these mistakes that you made, these parapraxis, as Freud called the Freudian slip. You have these mistakes that you made, which of course Freud would argue these review what we really want to have happen. We really want dad to see that hot picture of ourselves. We really want Barb to find out what we think about her finally. So there's that. But also that when these bad things happen to us, skip the dishes, order in some food. So feed yourself as comfort, and we have that whole category of comfort food, when you have this kind of psychic problem going on. And then just to wrap it all up in a neat little bow, um, of course, when we're looking at digital and social media platforms, we talk about the news, the news feed. We talk about your feed on Instagram or Twitter, as though we're being fed by that social media. And indeed, when somebody puts a hot pic of themselves up on Instagram, we, what do we call it? We call it a thirst trap, as though the person who's looking for likes on Instagram is thirsty. Clint, now there's been obviously the move uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we live in pandemic times. Eddie Van Halen decided today there's like a lot of different stuff going on. Um, but you've had to, um, uh, as with a lot of people in the post-secondary context, to move to teaching online over Zoom or Canvas or whatever platform. And how do you think through that or and how is that actualized in, in, the, in the context uh, for you in terms of it as a cultural phenomenon that's happening? Let's start with the hard stuff, though. Let's put, put to the side all the cute little Freudian kind of stuff and look at the politics of it. And here there are two aspects of it, I think, that are really worrying. And they both have to do with how big tech is trying to control thought. So uh, an egregious example is a couple of weeks ago, there was going to be a talk by Leila Khalid, 
Is that right? Uh, Palestinian activist uh, in her 70s at the SFSU at San Francisco State University. And this talk was going to be online, like everything has to be these days. And it was shut down by Zoom and Facebook and YouTube. So big tech, which is involved, and I f believe that YouTube is owned, no, YouTube is owned by Google. So it's three companies. So it's not even just all just Facebook, but it's three different companies. Um, and so they're stopping the, uh, uh, the spread of information, the free democratic discussion of political ideas. Um, and in part, this, is, uh, this has been argued, this is because of a, uh, uh, if not Israeli, Israel-funded uh, sort of psyops app, a, a group called Israel Action Team, which is active on the, uh, the platform Telegram. Um, so it, it mobilizes people and it has all these... Uh, uh, sort of like uh, uh, boilerplate uh, emails or, or Twitter or Telegram or Instagram or Facebook sort of messages to put out there. And so they mobilize. It's like a, you know, like a, a troll farm, essentially, that they go after, go after public institutions to stop uh, these kind of uh, um, uh, determinations of Palestinian uh, ideas. Um, so that's really very troubling, and, and uh, Facebook and other owned uh, social media as well have been uh, shutting down Antifa uh, accounts, uh, as though Antifa is, you know, again, this, this mistaken idea that it's one ideology as opposed to sort of like a more like a, a decentralized uh, sort of group of, of, uh, of, of left, leftist activists. So that's th those, those ways in which big tech uh, that we are more and more rely on, reliant on with uh, with uh, the pandemic is uh, very much one that is interested, that wants to police thought and wants to police thought uh, uh, in an anti-democratic function. But also the other side of it, yes, of course, I, so I've been teaching on uh, on Zoom and, and like I mentioned, Lacan Salon is now, uh, we're now circulating on Zoom. And I mean, there are many amazing and wonderful aspects of uh, computers and the World Wide Web and the internet and uh, the digital in general. I mean, that's a very important sort of thing to keep in mind. Many of us have jobs that we can only do now because of because of this kind of uh, technology. Uh, ideas are much more available. Books are much more available. Uh, films and music and culture is available in a global way that was uh, we couldn't have conceived of 30 years ago. And these are very. I mean, it's, it's really important to keep that in mind when we're talking about the problems that are that are associated with this. But there's also, and uh, the former uh, VP academic of my university said, you know, what the pandemic is showing us is what SFU is going to look like in 2030, i.e. that they want it to be more and more online, that they want more and more education to happen online. Um, and that's that's troubling because education should still take place, even like even in this this incredible setup that that uh, the, the technicians and the the infrastructure that it took for us to be here today is different than if we were doing it on Zoom or if we uh, if it was just audio. Um, but so those political things, I think, are really important to sort of keep in mind as 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 threats to education, as threats to uh, democratic uh, discussion. Is, of there, ideas. is there a worry around um, uh, in terms of recording lectures in asynchronous way that the content that you teach in a particular year will be reused by the university, for example, or in, in the context of precarious labor like sessional instructors where uh, courses that they they teach will then be recorded and utilized by the institution in contexts where they don't get paid in in the future. Is there uh, concerns raised by your colleagues? Related? Yeah, and by the union as well, FUFA, the SFU Faculty Association, uh, because we do have IP rights to to courses that we teach. Um, and uh, I mean, I, th I think it depends on a department by department or discipline by discipline sort of. Uh, um, idea because there is there's always this sort of these ideas coming from well-meaning colleagues in different disciplines well why not just record your lectures for the semester then you then you don't have to re-record them and as though from myself and many of my colleagues in you know in the humanities of the social sciences Every year you're teaching differently. Um, you, I would bring in, you know, different new works of poetry or, or what have you. Uh, I try to be responsive to what is happening. My, my lectures this year, I could never use them again because they're all referring to COVID. You know, so they're they're they're, they're you know they're out, they'll be outdated, you know, 
let's hope, uh, within a year, 18 months. Um, so, uh, but there are those kind of pressures and ideas that, of, you know, towards centralization. Um, and I think, you know, in terms, certainly in terms of uh, the, the uh, educational precariat, the sessional and other sorts of, and other forms of, uh, of labor, there is, uh, there's also the fact that people are doing more work because teaching online is a big time suck. There's more prep. Uh, you're sort of chasing after students more. They're chasing after you. Uh, it takes more time to to read and pay attention to written comments than if just if you're sitting down in a room with people for 45 minutes. Um, so uh, and those things can be more exhausting as well. Yeah. So to get through the 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 rainy season during the pandemic times, you've uh, got yourself a. Canadian tire tent to block the rain. How's it working for you? You actually are going to bring that up. Yeah. He said he was going to bring it, that does up. Does it feel the rain so you don't have to feel it? I actually should have had my, you know, my Canadian tire logo <laughs> on the back of my shirt to get some product placement money yeah. here from yeah. them. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, very fortunate to, uh, to, to live in a house <laughs> and um, to have a yard and uh, to be able to sit outside and to have friends like yourself and others uh, drop by. And so we... We made the $150 purchase of a uh, of a Canadian Tire uh, Kofor. I draw the line though at the uh, the outdoor heaters. Yeah. I think they should be banned everywhere. I think that they're you know my, when I was growing up, if I left the door open, my mother would say to me, "We're not heating the neighborhood." Actually, now it turns out everyone is heating the neighborhood and you know heating the planet in a way with oyster burners. Mm -hmm. But yes, uh, we'll do what it takes uh, to get through. Is the there season. a question in the audience? Is Melissa there? Yeah, can you please go ahead. I know you've been waiting for a while. And, oh, I'll rephrase well. it because well, well, just Melissa so to get is, it on is such thing. a is such a, a diligent person that she's got her mask on, uh, yeah. as, as technicians in the room do as well. Um, so the question was asking uh, was about interpassivity and how we want to be loved and how that works out in terms of the uh, the digital age and with the move online. I'll start with a with a you know there's this, this cartoon I saw the other day. Uh, which shows somebody in a Zoom meeting or something and uh, somebody else is saying to them, I can't tell if you're looking in my eyes or you're looking at your email. And, uh, <laughs> you know, which can be, you know, I'm looking at my email from my other girlfriend, right? Like it's a, it, it, you know, you, it, there's always this kind of like a adulterous aspect to, uh, to when, you, when, you're on, when you're on Zoom because you're always trying to multitask, which is what we're called on uh, to do all the time. Um, yeah, and I think that that, that where you're looking and who you're looking at. I have been thinking about that in terms of Zoom and also who you're speaking to and who is speaking. So I was talking about the, how uh, big tech is silencing uh, political debate, uh, but there's also a way in which, uh, and everyone who's, who's now a, who's a, any kind of a professor or an instructor, when they're on Zoom, we have this phenomenon that we call the Zoom silence. So, you know, I've got my uh, my 20 minute sort of lecture. Uh, maybe I'm narrating a PowerPoint. Let's hope not. I try not to do that because those are really boring. But I'm talking away all these great ideas. I, you know, I spent the day sort of working on for this lecture that I'm delivering. Um, and 15 or 20 minutes in, uh, I sort of realized I haven't heard anything. And it's like, it's really like, uh, disturbing not to hear anything. You now, before, if I was, you know, and I've been, I've been in this very room and given lectures and so on. And if somebody started talking in the middle of my lecture, I would have been really upset. And I would say, I'll take questions later. Let me just finish this thought and so on. But uh, now I almost want to hear something. It's only, you know, as we say, it's just crickets. It's not even crickets. You, know, you can't even hear any crickets. And and students also will talk about how. When, we, when there is a discussion going on, they're not sure if they should unmute their mic to talk because is, is what I'm going to say important enough? And so there's this way in which in, in, media, techno, in media theory, it's called the affordances of the, uh, of the interface or the affordances of the technology. So the affordances of, uh, of Zoom is that, you know, usually if you're listening to a lecture, everyone's mics are muted, but it, re it sort of results in this real sort of deathly silence. Um, or the other thing, going back to looking at each other, um, of course, everyone knows now that when you're on, 
when you're on Zoom and all people only of my age in their 40s or 50s will remember this, but there used to be a TV show called Hollywood Squares, which would have this grid of people uh, sitting uh, all above it. And they're actually, it wasn't even just a grid. It was a set built with people on chairs above each other and, this, and their names and so on. Um, and now we're in this kind of Hollywood Squares of Zoom where there's this sort of grid in front of you. But of course, everyone's grid looks a bit different. Like if, if I point up right now on Zoom, it doesn't mean the person above me is going to see me pointing at them because they may be below me on their grid. But there's also this whole thing of where you're looking. So if you have like a usual kind of uh, uh, laptop screen, uh, there's a little camera at the top with a light on it to let you know that it's on. And if you look at the camera, you can't actually see anybody's eyes in the grid itself. Whereas if you look in somebody's eyes, then you, they can't see you looking into the camera. So they, it looks as though you're looking away, uh, i.e. that you're on an email and so on. So this whole, whole interplay of where people are looking and what they're looking at results in a very kind of discombobulating sort of uh, uh, lack of trust in the uh, in the actual medium itself, which I think it on the one hand, like the Zoom silence, these are reminders that because we don't want to be nostalgic for too or too nostalgic. I was already nostalgic for being here with Am, but you don't want to be too nostalgic for the idea that in a classroom that's when the real teaching takes place. And there's many obstacles, both uh, you know, socioeconomic or just simple misrecognition or the spatial logic of the room and so on that mitigate against real kind of learning taking place. And so we always have to be thinking about this. But in the same way now with this technology, there's a whole new set of things that are making learning and genuine conversation taking place. But I will say, and uh, I was talking with a colleague about this today who is teaching in our graduate program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in terms of uh, Lacan Salon, and I'll be, I'm talking at, uh, at the Salon in a few hours. I will say that there is an amazing amount of real conversation and dialogue that can take place with this technology. Mm -hmm. um, it is possible. And that's why, what I mean. I don't want to like just totally, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater and be this kind of Luddite who thinks the technology is bad and so on. It's not that the technology is bad. It's just that it offers a different kind of, uh, what would Heidegger call it, kind of in framing of our being that we have to be aware of and to be critical of at the same time. And both those institutional or or apparatus kind of in framings, and then the, uh, I think the more malevolent sort of ways in which big tech is using this moment as a way to monetize education and crush free expression. And interesting, it kind of comes up also at time of the proliferation of fake news and uh, general challenges to sovereignty, like the stuff that Benjamin Bratton talks about in the stack. It all gets uh, really, uh, amplified or accelerated in a, in a moment uh, like this. Uh, I do want to get nostalgic for a moment, which has to do with uh, uh, any uh, thoughts, memories of Eddie Van Halen. You're always the one with the uh, the rock uh, uh -huh. the rock references. I remember, I'll get nostalgic, uh, when we were doing Humanities 101 uh, 20 years ago, and uh, we had a, a talk that was given at the, uh, I think we were at the storefront in what's now the Portland Hotel, um, and uh, you brought, it, brought out a uh, Twisted Sister album for somebody <laughs> that you gave to them. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I do like, you know, Van Halen's California Girls, you yeah. know, you know, or Jump, right? Like, yeah. I mean, I'm wearing white jeans, right? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm halfway there and you got the headband. So yeah. between the two of us, we could do, you know, lower yeah. half me, upper half, uh, totally. upper half am. And you got, the, you got the better hair than I do. So wondering if you have a time, if you'd share a, a poem with us. Um, so I'm just going to read the first, uh, this is about a five or six page poem, but I'll read the first couple of pages of it. No poems on stolen land. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on stolen land. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on borrowed land. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on pickpocketed land. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on overdue land. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on full land. I'd like to acknowledge that we are on empty land. I'd like to acknowledge that we are trespassing on someone else's property if that someone else had property, and if we are who we think we are and not, in fact, perhaps also someone else's acknowledgement. 
I'd like to acknowledge the knowledge of like to acknowledge you like me acknowledging. I'd like to acknowledge I meant that. I'd like to acknowledge I meant to say we're on land that was emptied when my grandfather moved here in what was it, 1948? I'd like to acknowledge my Dene sister. I'd like to acknowledge my Gitscan brother. I'd like to acknowledge my Tsleil-Waututh cousin. I'd like to acknowledge my Nuchalnef mother-in-law. I'd like to acknowledge my Squamish daughter. I'd like to acknowledge my Okanagan boyfriend. I'd like to acknowledge that we are getting into dangerous territory here. I'd like to acknowledge that my grandfather moved here in what was it, 1948, and then went back to Winnipeg and then came out again with my grandmother and my dad. And I'd like to acknowledge I always hate it when I see the little items on maps saying IR30, but I also like seeing IR30. And it's usually in italics for some reason because they acknowledge how their little spaces marked IR30, both part of the cities of human habitation, which are on the maps and the landscape in time immemorial, blah, blah. I'd like to acknowledge the last five minutes of colonialism. I'd like to acknowledge 50 pages of post-colonial bibliography. I'd like to acknowledge the virtual res. I'd like to acknowledge the talking memory stick. I'd like to acknowledge the suburban res. I'd like to acknowledge the low res res. I'd like to acknowledge acknowledging. I'd like to acknowledge the brass mask my uncle made at reform school in the 1960s on Vancouver Island. I'd like to acknowledge the hot chocolate I had on army maneuvers on Skokale land in July, 1980. I'd like to acknowledge both I can't acknowledge and I'd like to acknowledge Oka. Stop there. Great. Thank you so much for joining us on Below the Radar. Thanks for having me, Am. Take care. Thanks for tuning in to hear from our special guest, Clint Burnham. And we want to also thank the technical team at GCA Production and Event Services for capturing this conversation so well and for accommodating us in the space with such close attention to the health and safety of all involved. You can find links at the Lacan Salon and other commentary by Clint in the show notes of this episode. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you next time on Below the Radar.